Okay, welcome to the Ancient Presence podcast, everyone. Today we have Dr. David Miano with us. We're very happy to speak with him. Uh, you probably know him from the World of Antiquity YouTube channel. If you don't, you definitely got to go check it out. He does amazing work exploring and teaching about ancient sites all around the world, kind of like what we do here. David is a historian with a PhD and specializes in the ancient histories of Israel, Egypt, the Near East, and the Eastern Mediterranean. He's written and edited several scholarly books and anthologies on ancient history, methods of timekeeping in antiquity, and advanced learning techniques. His other chief interests include the literary and intellectual history of ancient cultures, early Christianity and biblical Hebrew, among other things. He previously taught at several colleges in California and now teaches and lectures at a college in Florida where he lives. David, we're very happy to speak with you today. Thank you so much for joining us on our channel. And how are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing great. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Nice. Yeah. Well, we're very happy to have the chance to pick your brain about stuff and share about our journey. And we'd love to hear about your journey. So I figured we could start with um, maybe you could give us a little background story about how you got interested in history and what led you through your academic studies and how you eventually started the YouTube channel and also how you went from your original purpose of your YouTube channel into the debunking work that you've also uh, <laughs> become quite well known for. Uh, sure. Um, well, um, I got started kind of late. Um, I was uh, working uh, at my father's uh, restaurant for, as a manager for many years. And then I wanted to do something else. You know, I wanted to um, get out of food service and and so I decided to go back to school and I wanted to, I always loved history. Um, I had gone to college a, a little bit earlier and I, I, tr I tried out computer science and then I tried out communications for a while. Uh, but when I went back, I decided um, I wanted uh, to do history and uh, I just liked history in general. And in fact, I had no plans to do ancient history. I just wanted to do history. And so I started taking classes there and then I was like, you know what? I, I like the ancient stuff the best, you know, <laughs> it was more interesting to me. So I started going down that track, you know, I just liked it because um, the further back in time you go, the more mysterious it is, the less we know about it, the less documentation there is, the more room there is to think outside the box. Uh, a lot of people think I don't like thinking outside the box but actually in school i had a reputation for it um and uh so that's why i got into it and i just kept going and kept going and until i uh, got my phd so yeah and i've uh never regretted it so i'm i'm very happy that i chose that course nice and so you started your youtube channel maybe what three years ago or so yeah in 2019 well, almost four years ago that's when we started uh, ours as well. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you know, you know, it is at the beginning. It's like, hope I get a hundred subscribers, you know, and, uh, totally. and it takes a long time, you know, it takes a very long time. Um, and I'm, I don't know if you guys were like this, but at the time I was, I was like planning big, you know, Oh, I'll have a hundred thousand in two years. Mm -hmm. You know, it took me three years. Um, so it always goes slower than you think. Um, well, you, and, you've uh, grown way quicker than we have. Uh, and I think that has a lot to do with how much content you put out. You know, I just, we, uh, I think I just passed 250 videos. Yeah. Wow. wow. We have like, and, now, of course, that includes so. the shorts, but um, I only started doing those in the last year or so. Uh, but yeah. And I don't know if you feel this way. You don't want to put out crap, right? <laughs> I mean, sometimes you, you know, some videos are better than others, <laughs> but, uh, I'm always like, well, no, I, I gotta make it better. And, um, and then you put it out and then of course you're, you're still not entirely happy with it, but, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I think some people grow faster than I do. I mean, if you look at people like, uh, mini minute man or something like that. Uh, he blew up fast. Of course he had TikTok before and that might have something to do with it, but, um, but other people go slower, and I I think I'm kind of just maybe medium speed. I don't know. Um, we're like we're like the slow pokes of the crew. We we take <laughs> we take so long to put out 
a single video that it's like I think it it's caused us to grow slow, but I'm I'm getting happier and happier with the content that we make. So that's good. We're we're growing as filmmakers and like learning how to actually do quality research. So okay, yeah, yeah. it's also yeah. tricky because we're two people with totally different lives and like I was living in Thailand for a while and Casey was in Oregon. Now I'm living in Peru. Uh, Casey and I were living together in Oregon for a while. So then it helped us focus a lot more. And we, you know, worked, we lived in the same house. So we had a lot more time to work on making content. And our first videos we were making like filming and doing our audio like in closets in turkey and like in <laughs> like in thailand like, and so it's like in hotel rooms <laughs> yeah well you know um the tortoise won the race right uh, yeah. so <laughs> uh, slow but steady uh is also a good strategy if you want to if you want good content you're like oh, i'm just going to put out quality product uh we're going to wait until we have it all set and ready to go how we want it um, people will appreciate that, you know? Yeah. Um, well, it, it's actually great. We did take it slow because, um, you know, it's, it's great that you're coming from a very academic background. We came from the opposite end of the spectrum. We we're just two like musician traveler guys who just were really interested in ancient history. And we both came from the, you know, lost civilization kind of mindset. We were really big fans of Graham Hancock for a long time. And, uh, we started our channel actually originally to like, prove the lost civilization or whatever. I mean, we always had very open minds and maybe actually I was more gung ho about it than Casey was. Um, he was probably more yeah, skeptical about it, but we started our channel with that intention. And actually it was great. We started getting a lot of feedback from people um, on our first few videos. We've taken a few of them down. Um, I think we might end up taking more down, but it's also kind of nice to leave them up to show the progression of where we came yeah. from to where we are now that's that's what ancient um, architects has done right he yeah you can exactly see his progression over the years um and yeah. i found like with him or with you the people who take the time to do the research gradually <laughs> come over <laughs> you know what i mean um it's just a matter of information that's it's just uh, getting enough information on the subject so people who really love the subject will study it and they'll read yeah. all the books they can find on it, you know, and then uh, they they end up um, <laughs> going towards the boring mainstream. But <laughs> that's kind of like why it's there. The, um, this this is a curiosity I had is like when we started this channel, the only YouTube channels that were really talking about this stuff are ones that were very lost, ancient, high technology focused. And we didn't really have the knowledge of how to do proper research on a lot of these ancient sites. And it's only through years of like dedication to it that we've discovered how to do good research. And one of my questions for you is like, how, how do you suggest people do quality research and what, what ways do you research and find quality uh, grounded answers to questions you have? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean um, it's, I guess you have to know kind of the places to look. Um, I went through academia, so they gave me a list of books, you know, read these, you know, <laughs> so I knew I, where to start. And um, maybe one day I'll, I'll make like a, a reading list for various. OK, you want to know everything about this, the pyramids? Here's the reading list, you know, or something like that. Um, but I was given those. But now when I want to look up something, there's certain resources you can go to. So you can go to like I go to Google Scholar. Uh, do some searches there, see what I can find. Um, I think once you get um, to know how uh, scholars write, you can tell a scholarly article from a non-scholarly one. And also you get to know some of the language. So sometimes when you first start reading an archaeologist paper, you're like, I only understand like a third of this, <laughs> you know, because um, what are the, this, there's this technical jargon and things like that. But once you start to know the lingo, it becomes easier, I think, uh, to read. Um, and uh, so, I mean, there are some things that you can more easily obtain when you go to a university library and you order uh, like through interlibrary loan there. So getting like a, a card at a university library would be like ideal because then you can go there, you can see what they have. They have mm. databases that you can have access to that you wouldn't otherwise. Um, and then you can order things that you cannot otherwise get. Mm. 
So that's how sometimes you can. Now, more and more uh, academics are pushing for everything to be open access, but it's still got a ways to go. You know, yeah, that, that's one thing that's been frustrating for us is a lot of the best articles and things are behind paywalls and uh, hard, hard to actually read. But uh, academia.edu and uh, archive.org have been like lifesavers for us and uh, research. And, yeah. And I don't know this is not an, um, entirely above board here, but I use Sci-Hub a lot. <laughs> Do you know what Sci-Hub is? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you just take the DOI and you can find access to it. Yeah, uh, I think it's important that people have access to the uh, to the articles, and I even put SciHub links in some of my um, video descriptions because I think people should be able to read the articles, and I think that the author of the article would want people to read the article. Uh -huh. you know? So, but I know the publishers totally. don't like that. So, <laughs> yeah, this is actually um, an interesting um, thing that we ran into with researching the Serapium. And actually, I would love to know, have you, as a as a person who comes from academia, ever like got your hands on um, an English version of Mariette's book about the Serapium? Because we I translated ourselves. We went through a painstaking effort to piece that together and translate it through uh, uh, Google I mean, that Translate. was a lot of work. It yeah, shows we're that, though, we that you're it. dedicated and you're hungry for the information. You want to know. Yeah. And that's like the most important quality to have, you know, in order to... Uh, make yeah. advancements in that but where, area. Like where, where is the scholarly edition that people can read? Like how, where do people, like, where is it? There must be an English somewhere. I mean, it's sitting on shelves um, in colleges, but like, where do we find that? Well, not, not necessarily. Uh, you know, what I, what I was told when I was in school was learn French. <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, I was required to learn how to read, I didn't have to be able to speak, but I had to learn how to read eight languages just so that I could read articles. Wow. Uh, and German and French were the two wow. modern, uh, German, French, and modern Hebrew for me were important. And then I had to learn f uh, five ancient languages uh, for my degree. And it was just, uh, you know, but oh my gosh. you have to learn German and French <laughs> just so that you can read the French and the German books and articles because so they're not wow, always cool. translated. You speak those languages fluently? No, uh, no. I just okay. reading knowledge. Okay. Just reading. What are the knowledge. What are the and five I, other ancient ones? The five ancient ones were, um, Akkadian, Aramaic, Hebrew, Greek, and um, Ugaritic. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. Uh yeah, but it's been a few years, and I'm a little rusty <laughs> in some of them, especially the German, but. Uh, do you yes. have any experience in reading like hieroglyphics or? Uh... No, I never learned. Egy Egyptian history was not one of the, I mean, I shouldn't say that. I did learn Egyptian history in the context of the ancient Near East. So I did have a general knowledge of it, but I, but I never learned hieroglyphs or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, I was more in the, in the area, in the area to the West of that. But um, since I've gotten out of school, I've expanded my horizons Um for teaching purposes and then also for the YouTube channel. Uh, so I'm kind of a generalist now in ancient history, um, which I think is good. I, I like to do uh, even histories of, of further away, like China, India, places like that. I saw uh, a lot of your videos from Mexico as well, uh, which yeah. I, have a, I have a fond love for a lot of the, the sites in Mexico. So that was really wonderful to see. Yeah, it's, uh, they, they sometimes uh, say, the best way to learn is to teach. And I found that mm -hmm. to be true, that when I'm doing research, I have to present it to a class or I have to present it in a video. I have to teach myself before I can teach somebody else. And that's how I learn, you know? Yeah, you have to fact check things and really get your, you know, your details all lined up in order. And yeah, it's actually a great process. It's, I mean, for us, like going through the, the Serapium series that we made, was a tremendous journey and a great um, experience for, you know, kind of ripening our own ways of researching. And we learned so much through, um, actually what, what happened is we just kept like learning more and more stuff. We started off with the one, we we're going to make one video on the Serapium and then it turned into two and then it turned into three because the deeper we dove into it, the more complicated and like really um, interesting that we, you know, we, we found the history about that site is so fascinating. All the renovations, the different staircases that were carved, the different doorways. And like, mm -hmm. yeah, we, like I said before, we, we kind of came from the lost ancient 
civilization mindset. And then like we, we, so we understand that mindset very well. We understand where people get their information. You listen to the Christopher Dunn's and the Graham Hancock's and like, you know, a lot of these guys are really intelligent and really, you know, people I, I do respect. And, and at the same time, I just think that so many of them have tunnel vision on and they're just avoiding, like ignoring so much information out there, so much evidence from, you know, archaeologists from the 1800s up until modern times. There's been so many studies that have been done. I mean, when I hear people like, um, like Yusuf Awiyan say that the name of the Serapium or Serapium, as some call it, um, comes from only three inscriptions from three of the boxes that are in those tunnels. It's just like almost unbelievable how incorrect that is. There were 7,000 artifacts <clears throat> found at the Serapium or around the Serapium. Many, many, many of them had the, the, the name of, of Osor Apis and many different versions of that deity and the names of kings. And there were almost, was it 12 or 1300 stone stelae that were found yeah. describing the entire history of the site. And it seems to me like um, a lot of these lost technology YouTube channels and stuff have no idea about those 7,000 artifacts or 1,300 stone stelae or about like basically any, they don't seem to know any of the history about the site at all. They just look at what they see today and see boxes and then they get their information from a guy like Christopher Dunn, who by the way has only measured one one single box in the Serapium. And not one. even the whole box, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. It, yeah. Um, it, you know what it is? The the appeal of it is it's kind of like a DIY, you know, uh, history. You can do it yourself and you don't have to start with anything. You could just go visit the site, look around, yeah. you know, <laughs> spitball it, you know, come up with some <laughs> ideas, brainstorm. You know, and then he can write a book about it, you know, and it, it doesn't require a lot of study. You know, um, I uh, I do think that people like Graham Hancock, because they've been around for um, a couple of decades doing this, um, they have done some reading. But um, not a lot. And people like what, Brian Forster, Forster or something like that, he doesn't probably do any reading. <laughs> Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, but the, that's the whole appeal of it there. Cause it's like, you can do it too, folks, right? You can, you can come up with your ideas. You can just go there and look around and say, Oh, I think it's this, you know, I think there was like a, a nuclear blast right here, you know, or whatever. And, um, you know, the sky's the limit, but that's appealing to people because it's easy and, um, and it, you can use your imagination, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I, like I said at the beginning, I believe in thinking outside the box, you know, coming up with new ideas, but you have to be constrained by the evidence, right? Um, you have to do the study first. You have to do the research first. Then you can come up with new ideas because you kind of know the framework that you have to build it in, you know? Yeah. And I, I find it like almost kind of dangerous to, um, teach people this way of thinking and studying the ancient world. It's almost like you're teaching people to just receive information from one source, not think about it critically or skeptically go there yourself and just point around and go, look, that stone cut over there. And that one over there, lost technology, lost technology. And they're just like looking through kind of almost like the wrong end of a funnel instead of like bringing all the information from many sources into one kind of unified understanding of a site you're looking from just a very limited kind of tunnel vision. Yeah. Yeah. And I find that like, um, it's kind of dangerous, you know, it's like you need context. Yeah. You need context yeah. and, and you don't see all the links, right? Cause everything is like kind of hooked together. It all overlaps and connects with each other and you can't sever those links because if you say, well, I'm going to redate this artifact, mm you might not realize that that would also redate this other artifact, which would in turn redate this artifact, which would then, and then it, there's a whole web and you just change everything. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, it isn't like you could just separate everything out and they'll even go so far as to separate the object from the inscription on it, right? Let's discard the inscription and just look at the object. <laughs> um, yeah. And what's ironic about that is, they want to separate in that sense to make things work, but mm -hmm. 
But then at the same time, they do the opposite when they want to link everything in the world, like all the pyramids come from the same source or something like that, you know, or all these handbags everywhere. They're all connected. So they want to connect those things which have very tenuous links, but the things like an actual writing on an object, it's like on it, they want to remove that. That's not connected at all, you know? Um, so it's kind of strange, but yeah. So have you have you noticed that this tendency to look for lost ancient high technology in all these places has it affected? Have you seen a change in like uh, your students in in uh, university and like how it's affected research and the tendencies of students uh, throughout the years? Uh, I I hardly ever got it, um, you know, ten years ago or whatever. Uh, but in the last five years, I've been hearing more of it. Um, you know, I, I'd be teaching, I, I used to teach an ancient Egypt class and um, as an elective. And uh, I get students asking about, you know, Zeptepi or the age of the Sphinx or th things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, before I started my YouTube channel, I didn't really um, know a whole lot about it, you know, about these, where these ideas came from. I'm just like, oh, it's a kind of a strange question. Um, and then I would just <laughs> give the answer. But I didn't have all the the data, you know, that I now have to be able to really give a thorough answer. So the channel has helped me in that regard. Mm -hmm. Well, it certainly has gained in popularity a lot in the last years. I mean, I think the Joe Rogan podcast and Graham Hancock. Oh, and, yeah. You know, that had a big thing, to, um, you know, big impact. And then the rise of the Bright Insights and the Uncharted X channels and Brian Forrester and people like this. It's just like created this tidal wave. And now actually what, what's really cool about that, I feel, is it it's create like we have a new internet culture that wasn't around 10, 15, 20 years ago. Before that, it was a lot of books, you know, Graham Hancock books and stuff like that, where people got this information. But the internet now has created, you know, YouTube where people can make money um, making content online. And so it's created this like environment where people can get paid to, do a lot of research into things. And so with the rise of the lost civilization popularity, it's also created kind of a counterbalancing rise of debunkers and debunkers oh, yeah. who can spend a lot of time like you and, you know, history with Kaylee and Milo, um, the Minute, mini minute man and Stefan Milo, which by the way, I would love to talk to them too. Cause I'm Milo and they're Milo. And it seems, Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> you have all three of you. In one time. <laughs> yeah. We should have a round table podcast <laughs> discussion, but it's great it's because funny. it's um, created like a new culture of debunkers too. So you've, you've got yeah. the rise of popularity of these fantastic ideas. And then the counter effect of that is actually fact checking them. And it's like, wow, it's actually quite ironic. It's kind of what happened to us on our channel. We started off with one intention to make a channel about the lost civilization. And then it kind of backfired on us. And we, you know, wisened up because, well, the research is there and people are doing the work. Um, people like Sacred Geometry Decoded, Scientists Against Myths you know, doing fantastic work. It's really, really a beneficial thing in the work you're doing as well. I think it's helping a lot of people get more grounded in their ways of understanding history. So yeah, good yeah. job. <laughs> you, do you find that, um, uh, I mean, do are you afraid that by moving away from where, you know, from the lost high technology uh, material that you're, I mean, do you worry about like not growing as fast because of it or, not getting a, as big of an audience. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's definitely, definitely like a, a factor. I don't, I don't know if it's really a concern because we're, you know, I think people will admire the work we do if they like it. And I think if anything, maybe we can even help people who, who like us were really indoctrinated into this lost technology, lost civilization kind of mindset to find their way into um, a more oh, well-rounded yeah. understanding. So yeah, I'm not too worried about the, the view count and stuff, but I, I do see that the popular, um, you know, thing on the internet is the lost civilization and it's less popular to just show people real yeah. history, which I is think kind that of goes, unfortunate. That's but... for, yeah. That's kind of with anything. Um, you know, it could be in any subject. If you're like, you're being lied to, you know, the, the establishment is lying to you. This is the truth. People click on that. You know, they just love that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There are people who, who believe something 
solely on the basis that it's against what the establishment says you know i mean like that's <laughs> to them that's it's automatically right you know mm-hmm. um i get a lot of uh angry people i mean there's a whole range of people but people come on and they get like passionately upset and we're, we're talking about things that happened you know thousands of years ago mm-hmm. um yeah. but they get like really emotional about it um and i'm not just talking about like you know, I, uh, some of my videos on India upset some um, uh, some of the conservatives in India. But, um, you know, you'd think like talking about a sarcophagus, you know, from Egypt, like how could that offend anyone? But people get offended. I, I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> but it happens. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've gotten any of that, but. I well, get that. Yeah, we get we get a lot of uh, nasty comments. We also get a lot of support. It, it's interesting. Um, it's been kind of uh, interesting to see how people respond to our Sarah PM series, for example. That was kind of a where we got a lot of, I think, because we had built such an audience with lost ancient high technology people that like releasing that. I think people, uh, yeah, they. They want us to make a whole box out of granite in order for it to be like uh, actually provable that it that's how it was done. Doing any little piece of it, for some reason, they get really angry about that. That we that we propose that hey, here's how it done. Like these people are doing it, and then they get angry and say that we have to make a whole box out of granite uh, with yeah. th- that. So I had yeah, one to fellow, me, to I had that... one fellow um, threatened to call my um college to complain about me to wow. my uh supervisor <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> that I was a a liar and you know I was misleading the public and all this kind of thing mm. yeah that would be an interesting conversation between those two guys huh <laughs> i know yeah it's but it is interesting that they wouldn't be willing to go that far i got a i someone um found my phone number and called me and uh and made some threatening comments like you know i'm gonna come and find you and, and things like that really yeah wow that that's, they never that's did, too much man yeah all because of my videos i mean but wow. of course not everyone is stable <laughs> but <laughs> yeah um yeah so I, why I would get such a reaction, I do not know. Um, well, we've we've never received any threatening comments like no, that. No, I don't mean to scare but, you. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they can come and find me in Peru. Good luck. I'm like living in 10,000 feet in the mountains here. I don't know if they'll find me. But yeah, it's interesting going back to what Casey said that um, a lot of these comments, we've gotten it, I don't know, 50 times like, oh, I'll only believe you or I'll only believe it can't be done with, you know, a Serapium sarcophagus uh, with lost technology if you make an entire box. I mean, we've heard it so many times. It's like that would cost millions of dollars and a whole team of people to dedicate years of their life learning the craft and then just going, you know, spending day after day after day grinding and cutting away at this sarcophagus. And I mean, it's just such an unreasonable request. I can't believe anyone would even make that request in the first place. Like, like, yeah, we've already seen in many areas how an artist can take a piece of anything and a tool and make great things all you really have to know is does the tool work you know and that's really all you have to know you know that an artist then could take that tool and do amazing things with it you know totally i mean like the trihedral cord corners have been demonstrated you know using large copper saws to cut directly through granite the tube drills it's like and polishing them to a perfect degree of flatness all those things have been demonstrated. I don't. I don't see why people, you know, need. It's because they whole still want to believe. They they still want to believe, and they they um, they 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 just raise the bar so that they can continue to doubt. You know, uh, that, exactly that it could be done. Well, yeah, always moving the goalpost. So there, there's plenty of mysteries still out there. Um, it yeah. makes me it makes me wonder why people tend to towards these ones that. Um, have the least amount of evidence uh, or like have the least amount of like, or have the most amount of evidence that they could be done. Uh, mm-hmm. My question is like, it, do you, what, what mysteries or biggest questions do you have about uh, history and like where, what sites intrigue you the most and like uh, call forth this feeling of like thinking outside of the box for you? 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, with ancient history, there's so much that so many gaps to fill, you know, how did this lead to this and so forth. I just bought a book um, it's on the table over here called The 70 Mysteries of Ancient Egypt or 70 Mysteries of Ancient Egypt. And it's 70 uh, actual legitimate like questions about like how how could this possibly be, you know, Um and I was even thinking maybe doing some videos on some of them. I, I th I'm thinking that people don't think that I don't believe in mysteries, right? Mm -hmm. That I think we know all the answers. And obviously, I don't. Um, so I just maybe want to show that by doing uh, some of these. But they're just things like, um, you know, uh, how if if um, I'm trying to think of some examples, um, but uh, like where did Akhenaten? get the idea about monotheism or something like that mm -hmm. or um you know like what what happened to queen nefertiti you know she disappears from the historical record what happened to her just things like that mm -hmm. or um you know when did this king actually reign who was the first uh woman ruler of egypt you know things like that there's all kinds of questions totally um that can speaking be of akhenaten uh do you know much about the concept that Akhenaten was actually Moses? Uh, well, I've heard that uh, the theory that um, Moses um, got the idea of monotheism from Akhenaten, which is an idea I think goes back to Sigmund Freud of all people. But um, there are so, still some people who think that that could be. Uh, it depends, of course, on when you would date Moses. Um, because the story is that Moses grew up in Egypt, right? Um, but I've never heard that Moses was Akhenaten. Um because, you know, obviously in the Moses uh, story, there's no um, mention of him being being the actual ruler of Egypt. But um, but I'm, I'm not surprised. Yeah, and, there's and... a book by a guy called Ahmed Osman. Um, mm -hmm. He's an Egyptian historian, uh, biblical archaeology society kind of guy. And anyway, I, <laughs> I remember hearing a podcast with him. Sorry, I'm just trying to find a little information. So he, he, he here, thinks but... that uh, Akhenaten he... could be Moses. Yeah, he's written several books on this. Um, it's quite interesting. I heard it, Casey and I listened to a podcast of him like maybe three or four years ago, so I forget the details, but there's a lot of interesting theories out there. Um, again, like you said before, a lot of people, once they hear anything alternative, they want to just dive in and believe it, um, you know, take it with a pinch of salt. But I think it's interesting for sure. Uh, speaking of alternative ideas, um, I'm currently working on a paper right now with Bob Schneiker, the geologist. Um, about the Sphinx and it's going to take issue with the current kind of consensus on uh, the Sphinx body and its erosion. So that should be interesting. I'll tell you guys more about it when we're, when we're closer to being done, but. So that was something I wanted to mention uh, a little while ago is, uh, you know, as much as these alternative claims and uh, lost ancient high technology stuff is uh, like kind of a bit absurd sometimes. There's also certain things that I've seen come of it that gets people talking and exploring like Robert Schock's mention of the water erosion on the Sphinx. I don't know if anybody would be talking about it unless he uh, proposed what he did and uh, and it's gotten a lot of great discourse from that. So the, I, I also see how these alternative researchers and, and researchers like diving into alternative history uh, actually advances the conversation in a way. And now, you know, millions of people. Oh, yeah. Are oh, talking I, about I it. think um, and I think uh, John Hoops, uh, an archaeologist, said this recently, that these these uh, these ideas do um, motivate archaeologists to um stay on the ball you know what i mean it's like yeah. okay all right well they're raising some questions how about giving us some answers you know and which they might not otherwise bother to do if mm -hmm. someone didn't challenge them on it you know yeah. um so you know it's not that the that these ideas are always good ideas but they do require someone to respond you know mm -hmm. so people have to respond um so i think it's a good thing in that sense yeah we, we have a funny part in our uh, Tannis part one video uh, where we show ourselves talking to an archaeo the main archaeologist at Tannis and us mentioning the water erosion on the Sphinx. We were like totally bought into that narrative at that time. And 
he immediately took this stance of like, okay, this is where the conversation ends kind of thing. And we said, so you're not even open to that. And he said, no, cause I'm an academic. And to us, that was like more convincing that the water erosion was like, Oh, cause they're like refusing to even talk to, to you about to even it. look at it. And so there was this like, yeah. You know, I see it now as like, okay, we were a bit schnozzy in that sense of like going full bore into it. But at the same time, <laughs> but like, you didn't know at the time, yeah. right? You thought, well, oh, it seems legit. You know, does, and, says it. And, yeah. And in some senses, like I haven't researched it enough. It seems still plausible to, plausible to me now. Like I, you know, I've seen some different uh, discourses debunking it, but I, I, you know, I don't know enough about it, but it, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem that far fetched to think that water erosion had something to do with it so precipitation uh well stay tuned for more on that yeah <laughs> i will say this about people like robert shock um and i've seen this with other people too uh academics who kind of go to the other side um they'll start out with very modest proposals like when robert shock first started he wasn't saying that the Sphinx was more than 10,000 years old. He was just saying it was a, older than uh, we thought. And um, but then he he went further, you know, because he was getting um, money from giving talks at various conferences, places that were the lost high tech. They were they were loving him. And so he found an audience and they were the ones that were, you know, wanted to read his books and so forth. And so then now he's catering to that crowd. Right. Once you have an audience, you have to start, you know, saying things to uh, to make them happy. And so his ideas get more extreme over time. And now he's saying things about connections with Gobekli Tepe and, and the Sphinx and all this. And and he's totally 100 uh, percent on board with that stuff. Um, and uh, now I think someone like Martin Sweatman is doing the same thing. <laughs> That's exactly what I was making a you connection know? to. Yeah, he's appearing at, at these conferences now. This is his bread and butter. This is the crowd that he's trying to appeal to. So he's going more in that direction. Um, so there's, I'm not saying these the, that there, either of them are dishonest. I'm just saying there is a pressure or a motivation to to cater to the to, to your bread and butter. You know, they're the ones that are supporting you, you know. So you want to kind of give them what they want. Yeah, I saw... Um... There's a video series, oh, I forget the name of the channel at the moment, um, where he's pointing out um, and making kind of comparisons to cult psychology um, with the alternative history crowd that once you're like, you find your new family, it's like classic cult behavior. Once you find your new family, everyone welcomes you. They love bomb you. And then you feel like you belong. And like, there's all these different um, components to that that get people excited. They feel like, wow, now I found my people. And then yeah, it, it could get really, um, really slippery. Um, yeah, I was, uh, yeah. I was considering maybe uh, <laughs> crashing the uh, the big conference coming up this summer, uh, <laughs> and to getting it on video, but I'm wondering that was too much of a like a stunt. Uh, I was actually initially invited by Graham Hancock to debate oh, yeah? him there. I don't know if you oh, heard wow. about this. Wow. No, but I, I am totally about this open debate stuff. I know that they are all, often ridiculing archaeologists and stuff, but like, I think there needs to be a lot of open debates that are put on YouTube for people to watch. Sure. I'm all about that. I mean, debates are, are largely performance, you know, but yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I prefer responding after giving it some thought and doing research and then responding, you know, uh, where off the cuff is more challenging, but I can do it. Um, it's just that later I'm going to be like, oh, I should have said that, or I forgot to bring up this, you know? So did um, you, did you deny well, Here's what happened? Um, so he, uh, uh, he, he put out a general call for an archeologist to debate him on Joe Rogan. Uh -huh. And, um, so I immediately said, I'll do it. I'm not an archeologist. I'm, I'm a historian, but I'm, I'll do it. I'll be there. Right. He didn't respond directly to me. Uh, and then he said, well, I want to debate John Hoops because this is this guy who's wrote written about Graham and Graham wanted to debate him. But John Hoops didn't want to do it. Um, so uh, so I said I'd do it. There's another uh, there's an archaeologist, Flint Dibble. He said he would do it. Um, but then there was silence for a while. And then Graham Hancock said, well. 
uh, I don't know if we can go on Joe Rogan, but he and he names both me and Flint Dibble and says I invite you to uh, come to this big conference, you know, and we can we can debate there. I said okay. I said as long as you're paying my way, I will be there. <laughs> and um, uh, then silence. And uh, so then I I asked some people behind the scenes who 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 are um, planning on being there about what's going on. And um, I don't know if the organizers didn't want to do it or whatever. They already had the schedule set, but it didn't happen. And then I found out that Flint got invited to by Graham to debate Graham on Joe Rogan in October or November, October, I think October, or November. So he will be there, but I think, um, Graham chose Flint because he's an archeologist and I'm not, that's what I'm thinking. But, uh, mm -hmm. so didn't happen. You should well, go on Joe Rogan anyway by yourself. Yeah, totally. Well, <laughs> Joe, Joe doesn't, um, Joe puts on people that he wants to promote. I don't know. I don't think he wants to push me. I mean, Bright Insight and Uncharted X, yeah, he'll push them, but he's not gonna, he's not gonna try to support me. I don't think, because he's on there, he's on that side, you know. Yeah, yeah I know I, that's I a tricky that. one. Like Joe Rogan is so gung ho about the lost civilization, and now he's selecting people to come on his show to just keep supporting that yeah. idea more and more and more, and millions and millions and millions of people are listening to that. I feel like he needs to bring someone on to kind of. Uh, I don't think the, he he's not a both sides side. necessarily kind of guy. He he just he has people that he likes and he wants to promote and and that's who he's going to do. You know, maybe this debate will help that. Maybe uh, maybe yeah. he hasn't had a, a regular archaeologist on. I don't think ever. I, um, I can't I've, even think of a single archaeologist he's had on. I've heard him. Um, there was a guy who was talking about ice age fossils in Alaska. I don't know if he was an archaeologist or what his profession oh, was. That, but... that guy's a like a, a he owns mining stuff. I don't think he was an archaeologist. Uh -huh. Yeah, I huh. think that's going to be great. I'm really looking forward to this conversation between Flint Dibble and Graham Hancock. Yeah. And actually, Flint Flint is now on my list of people I want to talk to. And actually, I listened to his talk with you. Um, oh yeah, he did a while back. That was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. It's um there is a, a division of opinion among academics about whether to engage mm -hmm. with such people in debates. You know, we they they're okay with writing about them, but engaging in a debate, uh they're not crazy some people are not crazy about it. Um why do you think that is? I mean, I think it's very um positive for the world to see that kind of thing you know well they think it's a it's a show you know what i mean they think it's um it's not serious um scholarship it's it's just you know it's the circus you know what i mean it's like performance and it's who who can appeal better to the audience and and uh and because it's all off the cuff you know and no one really can fact check people can say anything it's like a presidential debate where you know you can say anything, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, um, and there's, you know, give false facts or whatever, and no one can really check it and, you know, all of that. Um, and they, there are some who uh, are against the idea of even going on Joe Rogan. Um, hmm. Oh, Joe Rogan is, uh, you know, he's uh, not a good guy and he should never support him. And, uh, this is interesting because my point of view is okay i can understand uh about not wanting to platform someone that you think is is putting out bad info right so like on my channel would i invite uh graham hancock on my channel i probably would not i want to have people that you can trust on my channel you know mm -hmm. but to go into their onto their platform I think that's a good idea because what are the, there there's more of a chance of you swaying their audience than of them swaying your audience, you know? Totally. Yeah, um, and I think it I think that needs to happen because it seems these days more people are interested in the lost civilization than real history. I feel like we need to counterbalance that and, you know, go on the Joe Rogan podcast and things like this and really show people um 
a more grounded approach to understanding the ancient world rather than just believing in all the hype, you know? Yeah. I think there's a, a there's also a fear that like some people are afraid that Flint Dibble, when he goes on, that Graham Hancock is going to make him look bad and he's not going to come across as well as he thought he was going to. And that's going to give a bad name to archaeology, you know, and it's going to turn more people off to archaeology. And there's always that possibility when anyone goes on to debate somebody, if they blow it, like Michael Shermer was on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and even though Michael Shermer is a smart guy, he didn't know all the details and facts about the various things that they were talking about. He only could speak in generalities. So he didn't perform the greatest, in my opinion, even though he was right <laughs> about most mm. of the things. Uh, and it just goes to show that if you are better <clears throat> at the debate, at debating, uh -huh. Yeah, you can look better at, at, to the to the audience. Um, and so that's what people fear is um, what if a, an archaeologist goes on there and then they make archaeology look bad? Well, mm. this is well, one I'm, thing I'm... that that we've been questioning as well is like with us releasing the Serapium uh, videos, are we even going to be able to get any lost ancient high technology people on our channel like to talk with us? Because like, I'm still interested in like having conversations and like, I would love to oh, have- Oh, I shouldn't, yeah, I, I didn't mean to, I wasn't even thinking about you guys. Like, I know you've had Uncharted X on and people like that. I, I, I'm not saying that there was anything wrong with that. I'm... Oh yeah, yeah, no, I, I didn't take it that way. It, it, okay. it, it's more just in the sense of like, I. I would love to have like Ben and other people on again, like, and Graham, I would love to talk with Graham in this way of like, almost just like giving them the benefit of the doubt that like they're, they think that they're doing the best quality research that they can and getting out of the way of just like, of my own opinions or judgments of how they've done it and actually have a conversation that just by like talking with them, uh, we can, maybe even understand why people that we disagree with believe what they believe. And I think that, yeah. and it's epistem epistemological process of like, just even understanding uh, human behavior on a, on another level. I'm, yeah. I'm kind of of the camp of like, I just want to be friends with everybody and make all of us come into this place of like, this isn't a war to be fought. This is actually something that can be enjoyable and that we can have disagreements and we can have like uh strong opinions and still actually have discussions that are meaningful and, and deep and we yeah. emerge out the other side, still friends. <laughs> yeah. It may be difficult going forward. I, I hope you can. Um, like, I mean, uh, has, has, um, has Ben been positive about his appearance on your channel? He he has been radio silent as far as I know. Uh, we, we've reached out to him a few times to talk uh, since then, and it's been pretty radio silent. You know, we've been very careful about how to speak about people and uh, really tried to just play this middle ground of like, we're not choosing sides in this. We just want to mm -hmm. like show show the facts and let it speak for itself and get out of the way of it. So we have no issue with Ben. Uh we find his tactics a little bit like strange in regards to like what he purports on his channel, but also like he's doing him. We've been around, we've met him in person and been around him and I really enjoyed his presence and we had great, great times together. So I, yeah, I mean, Ben, Ben is, he's actually a great guy. He bought me lunch. We went out to Indian food um, in California. Like he lives where near where I grew up. <clears throat> so I reached out to him some time ago and we, we had a nice long talk and, yeah, I think Ben's a good guy. Like, I mean, we we really enjoyed our talk with him. I would love to communicate with him more. Like Casey said, he's been kind of radio silent lately. I wrote him some months ago and he said he was on his way to the Scablands and, uh, with Randall Carlson. And so he was like about to take a trip. And then I wrote to him like maybe three weeks ago and he was just about to leave to Turkey. So he, you know, he's a busy guy. I understand like he doesn't always have time to reach out, but I, I would love to catch up with him. He did write one long, really well thought out and thorough comment on our first Serapium video because we put some of his footage in there and directly kind of, you know, debunked his statements. Um, and then he we wrote back. Yeah, he wrote one response, but that was it. And then no, nothing on parts two or part three. Um, we even did invited you, him. Did you, did you respond to any of his uh, objections in part two or three? Um, I mean, they were Not basically- Not directly, all... but I mean- they were basically okay. covered all in part one. It was more about stone cutting techniques. Oh, okay. But 
so yeah, I, I mean, I, I wrote back a really long <laughs> comment. Like he was, he was doubting whether the Aceta project or um, uh, scientists against myths were using <laughs> their angle finders correctly. He was doubting whether they zeroed them out and whether they were getting um, accurate oh. readings on the on the night. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I got it's something just, caught in my throat. That's <laughs> all good. <laughs> um, yeah, and so like the thing is though, a lot of people focus on just the stone cutting aspect of the Serapium, for example, but there's the historical aspect, there's the staircase cutting, the extension of the tunnels. You know, there's so much more to look at there, the translation of hieroglyphics, um, the double rails that um, that were found inside the tunnel that most people have no idea about. The fact that Mariette lowered a box himself into a chamber, um, the winches, you know, there's so much information to discuss there. It, it, I see a lot of people in our comment section just looking at our part one video and not looking at part two or three. And there's yeah. like an enormous amount of historical yeah. context you have to put the site into. Mm -hmm. So I feel like Ben, Ben kind of just, that's as far as we got with him, but I would love to go deeper and discuss, like, I mean, for me, the staircases is one of the things that really fascinates me about that site. You can clearly see the progression from the older vaults uh, that eventually had a ceiling collapse. So they, they carved a new doorway and started a new series of vaults. And then that got doorway got blocked. So then there was a makeshift new doorway that was created and then eventually later on, um, the, and they had to ca carve through the old staircase and basically demolish the original entrance into the older vaults. And none of that would make any sense if the older, if the the great galleries were built by some lost civilization, and then the Egyptians tried to copy them later by building the smaller and more crude lesser gallery. Yeah. It just wouldn't would not make sense at all. So people just see stone cutting Christopher Dunn, and they get caught up on those little details, and they want to debate that forever in the comment section. I always tell them watch parts two and part three and come back and I'll talk to you then. And a lot of them don't, they haven't yet. <laughs> I think, I think part three is the most convincing and just the staircases alone to me is like some of the most like solid evidence of yeah. dynastic Egyptian built Serapium. Yeah. It's yeah, just one of those, another one of those examples where you can't take it out of its historical context. You have to look at all of it. And explain your whatever theory you have must account for all of the things that you see. Uh, you can't just say, "Well, let's just look at the boxes," and that's all. You know. Yeah. So, uh, one thing I wanted to to ask you about, uh, and kind of changing subject, is uh, we had read the book America Before by Graham Hancock, and uh, we learned. A lot of great things that got us inspired about a lot of American sites that we never even knew about before. And it was through a, a cross country road trip that Milo and I did where we visited probably 50 different archaeological sites in America that we started to like question like, uh, you know, for our whole lives, we had heard of like Clovis first and, uh, you know, the crossing of the land bridge and you know, 13,000 years ago uh, was like the earliest inhabitation of uh, the Americas. And then, you know, uh, exploring places like the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter. I don't know how much you know about uh, American, uh, North American history or uh, like different sites like Cactus Hill and the Galt site in Texas. Uh, but these are sites, you know, and the footprints that they just found in uh, New Mexico. Uh, these are sites that go back 20,000 years. And through reading America before, he also mentioned some sites in South America and, uh, you know, different proposal of like, I think he at one point mentions uh, Polynesian, uh, there being Polynesian uh, bloodlines found in South America. And so it makes me wonder like, what, how, how far back does the history in the Americas go? And why is it so hard to to even come up with a definitive answer for this, especially with like places like the Cerruti Mastodon site in Southern California, where, you know, these credentialed scientists are giving giving like te testimonies of like it defying going back 130,000 years or whatever. And like, so it makes me question, like, why is this so hard to even come up with a, even a slightly definitive answer about this uh well first let me say this is not in my area so like i uh -huh. i prehistoric uh uh america prehistoric anything is not really up my alley but hmm. i do follow a little bit of it uh especially because people are always 
writing in the comments, Clovis first, Clovis first, you know, um, uh, as if that just saying that proves something. But um, uh, but I will say this, we are in a transition right now, right? So for the longest time, nothing had been found definitively that was that old. Um, there were a couple of things that were like, maybe but questionable because well well wait maybe we we got the dating on this wrong or maybe that is not a, a human made mark you know and things like that so it was still kind of unsure and i even saw recently the footprints are still under question as well mm. um so but we're kind of i'm seeing um archaeologists from that who work on that time period gradually kind of shifting their mindset so we probably will i mean i think things are already starting to be pushed back but we're in a transition state right now where not everyone is on board yet they need to see more they, they need a little bit more evidence and so forth and then even if you have evidence that yes they were there earlier uh you have to figure out how they got there there's just a lot of unanswered questions mm -hmm. so it's one of those mysteries that we're talking about right where there's still a lot um that needs to be found before we can really know anything for for certain. What I find interesting about that, though, is you know the Graham Hancock often um, portrays archaeologists in this really negative view that they're arrogant and stubborn and refusing to change their minds about anything. But from what I've seen, it's really the opposite. Um, they're very willing to change their minds once evidence is presented that makes sense that just you know shows a new version of history. And uh, yeah. I think it's it's quite ironic to me. It it seems more like and I don't want to bash on Graham. I think he's a great guy, but like he's the one who's arrogant and stubborn and and resistant to change and attacking people's personal character and all the things that he's kind of accusing others of doing. But I, I've heard, you know, different interviews and seen articles and things from archaeologists who d address this exact thing that when new evidence comes along, they change their mind. And that's great. That's exactly what science should do. And that's that is what happens in archaeology. I mean, I have to wonder if Graham Hancock would truly be happy if suddenly archaeologists agreed with him. <laughs> because then he loses his his whole brand. You know, like it it works for him to say archaeologists are not listening to him and they're refusing. That's what sells the books. He wants to be a martyr. Yeah. As soon as like, oh, I'm mainstream, <laughs> you know, he, he lost his 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 aura. You know, he doesn't have the 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 maverick identity anymore. You know, he's not the rogue uh, that he um, likes being, you know, um, I think a lot of his complaining is just part of the shtick, you know, um, just part of the brand. Um, well, that's I was watching my, his series. That's been my question is like, he, he portrays it as if he doesn't have a platform and yet he's platformed more than any other archeologist I've got seen. got a Netflix series. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. Um, I, I, I just think, um, he, he knows what works. It's part of his playbook. And, uh, and I, when I watched his series, I can, cause I've been, you know, I went on the unexplained ones, you know, yeah, I saw and it. yeah, they, what they happened kind of with that? You. They pro <laughs> they go, like, we're trying to play up the mystery here. So could you t say more things like, well, uh, we don't know, you know, we just can't understand that. They wanted me to say stuff like that. And they kind of encouraged me. So I'm, I'm picturing the same thing happening when, when, when uh, Hancock is doing his, series here could you say more about how the archaeologists are out to get you and they're attacking you <laughs> we this, the audience will eat that up and so he's like oh okay and i i can just imagine that i mean i don't know but i think there might be some of that in there you know totally yeah and speaking of the netflix series i've really enjoyed all the debunk content um potholer 54 i think i learned about that mm -hmm. from your post he he makes yeah, me yeah. crack up man he's hilarious <laughs> He is just, uh, he's been destroying Graham Hancock's series. Um, actually, if you guys want to talk about Gurung, Gurung Padang, I, there's some interesting stuff in there that really kind of caught my attention. Um, like Graham used to pro portray it in his, you know, imagery as like a very rectangular shaped, gigantic megalithic pyramid. And now he's showing it as more as a rounded hill with the site on top. Um, I see the way he he's like trying to change his view, like change his way of portraying it to kind of 
seem more like he's, I don't know, changing with the times or whatever. The one interesting thing, like when it comes to the, um, the inner chambers of a 24,000 year old pyramid, you know, those are simply just lava tubes. It's a volcano. Um, and he should know that. I mean, and so should Danny Hillman, not the who's the leading, you know, um, yeah. seismic tomography expert who was doing that study. But, you know, it's interesting what he leaves out is things like Danny Hillman wrote a book called Atlantis is in Indonesia. Like he, he is <laughs> going to that site to try to prove Atlantis. He's not an objective scientist. And same with the other yeah. guy he interviews, um, in the series and there's so many things wrong with the way that graham hancock presents that site it's clearly just a volcano with lava tubes inside there's no chambers they're not rectangular the seismic surveys show them very oddly shaped and irregular um and the one that really got me okay i i can understand that people are so convinced they're just trying to really i don't know hype up this idea but if you falsify evidence to me that's where things get really like that's a moral issue. And as potholer 54 showed on his YouTube channel, um, Graham airbrushed out the question mark on Danny Hillman's original poster that said chamber question mark. He took away the question mark. So it just says chamber. And in the Netflix series, he presents it as a chamber with an entrance hall and a, and an access corridor yeah. or something like that. And that is so misleading and disingenuous. And I mean, he's, he's literally falsifying evidence. I must say that that is just unacceptable. I really, mm -hmm. wow. I was quite shocked to see that he's, he's altering mm -hmm. the original, you know, evidence that, that Danny Hillman presented. What do you, what do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I saw that, uh, that potholer video as well. And uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's going beyond just, you know, having a theory that's out there, you know, when you try to uh, doctor thing. And I also heard, um, I can't remember from where, that um, one of the archaeologists he interviewed, you know, he, 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 he usually interviews like a real archaeologist at the beginning, and then he'll interview one of his buddies, you know, after that um, in each episode. And, um, but one of the archaeologists, I think it was the one from, from uh, Mesoamerica, not, I can't remember now. He he complained afterwards that he his, his his word bites were taken out of context to make it sound like he was saying something other than what he what he said. Now that happens whenever you go on TV, but um, yeah, it's he's not as above board as you think he might be. He sounds like <laughs> such a reasonable guy, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I used to think he presented the viewpoint of archaeologists in a sort of objective way. At least that was my younger mindset I was in. And like, he does not. He absolutely does not. He he just leaves out huge pieces of information that don't fit his narrative. He just yeah. disregards evidence. And then he paints this uh, picture of them in a really false manner, which I just think is really unfortunate because a lot of people only get their in information about real archaeology through people like Graham Hancock. And they read about it and he quotes them in his books and he talks about their articles and their books. And it seems like, wow, like he's really presenting them as fairly as he can, but he's really not. And I, I just, uh, yeah, I don't vibe with that. Yeah. I uh, people have been asking me to do a, a critique of ancient apocalypse, but everybody's doing such a great job. I am going to do <laughs> a video on Bimini Road because I'm going to go there. Oh, nice. Um, it's are not you going to scuba dive from where I live? So, yeah, I'm going to head over there and and are you going to dive? This I'm going to scuba dive and do the nice. whole thing. Yeah. Wow. Um, and uh, do a video on that. So that's probably coming up within a month. I'll, wow, that's I'll do awesome. that. Cool. Yeah. I mean, show us that beach rock, that yes. non-megalithic. Well, this is another thing. I want to say this in the video, but it is true that geologists say it's beach rock. But the way Hancock says it is like he's he acts like they just say it's like rocks on a beach. You know what I mean? Like when you say beach <laughs> rock, it sounds like just, you know, rocks on a beach. <laughs> but actually, beach rock is a technical geological kind of stuff of, of formation. Um, but it sounds like, oh, okay, just rocks on a beach. And that's the way kind of Hancock presents it as like, oh, and geologists want us to believe it's oh, beach rock, you know. Um, like they don't even know what they're talking about, you know. Um but there's a lot of science to it. Well, that's yeah, that's I one found thing. that one interesting. 
That's one thing I find in all of our research is I think I maybe thought a lot of there was a lot more mm, less rigorous work than there is. I in doing our research and looking through papers and like articles like online, it's amazing how much work and dedication a lot of these scholars have to uh diving into these sites and like very very focused uh long-term work that they've done and so to like i guess maybe before i kind of just thought like yeah like they're just you know looking and deciding for themselves but it's actually like very scientific yeah work yeah that they're doing they, yeah they that that's this is why they get irritated with people like hancock is because they put in years of blood, sweat, and tears, you know, to try and study something. And then someone comes in, just looks at it for a few minutes and is like, oh, I think it's this, you know. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And then they get all these followers. <laughs> yeah. But, he uh, did that at, um, at Nan Madol also off uh -huh. the coast of, uh, is it Pompeii? The island out there in Micronesia, yeah, yeah, yeah. where he he dove on the site and said, "Oh, there's megalithic pillars underneath the ocean, that which means they must have been above ground, you know, in the last ice age, lost civilization." And, oh, it's and, not near Pompeii. I think it's it's over in the South Sea, isn't it? In the Pacific. Yeah, or where? Not Pompeii. What? Um, what's the island there? Anyway, he he basically just completely disregarded the fact that you know there were studies on those so-called megalithic pillars under the ocean. It's coral. They 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 drilled into them. They pulled one up. They cut it open. It's just coral. It's not man made at all. And he should know that. There's scientific publications that have been out for decades on that. Yeah. It's like, yeah, silly. So, so yeah, you know, when you omit, you can omit information. Um, you know, uh, and if you omit it, is that lying? Hell, I just didn't mention it. You know, <laughs> it's definitely misrepresenting. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So with your folk, uh, like your specialty in uh, the Middle East and uh, that area. My, yeah, um, well, my my area of expertise, what, what I studied in uh, grad school. Uh, yeah, uh, that, I guess was that, the, that, that would be the question is like, where do you feel like you are the most uh, knowledgeable? Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, I would say in the ancient Near East, um, you know, everything from the Levant to Mesopotamia. But like I said, since I, I left school, I have definitely broadened my horizons uh -huh. um, and I've done a lot of reading in, in other areas as well. So um, but I mean, the whole Eastern Mediterranean world, I'm very much interested in and I know that very well. And I've taught classes on, you know, ancient Egypt and ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Um, I've done world history in the ancient period. Um, so um yeah, I mean, I'm kind of a generalist now, but yes, my tr my formal training was in the history of the ancient Near East. So yeah. we're working on a, a video right now about Gobekli Tepe and also on Baalbek, a separate video. Uh, but in my research on Gobekli Tepe, I came across actually a paper by Robert Schock uh, where oh. he uh, suggests that some of the, the first writing actually appears at Gobekli Tepe. Uh, that then is reminiscent of the Luwian Luwian uh, culture, that, uh, and it made me, you know, wonder if what do you know about the the origins of written language, and uh, does that seem to be a possibility? That uh, I mean, this is like thousands of years before uh, writing was supposed supposedly developed. Yeah. Um, well, first of all. There is no writing at Gobekli Tepe. <laughs> there's no writing. I think wasn't it the H symbol? You know, there's like that belt, like the yeah, H. yeah, yeah. There are I symbols. Think that was it. Yeah, there are symbols, but there's no writing. You know, um, and an H symbol is like <laughs> one of the most basic, simple things you can draw. You know, um, there is, um, but prior to writing, the invention of writing, there is, I guess, what we call. Uh, proto writing you know pictographs things like that but i don't even think you have that at gobekli tepe um there are symbols you know certainly there are symbols there are uh, um some some of the uh, art is is decorative um some is representative of you know obviously you have animals and people and things like that 
but there is no writing in any sense of the word um, there. Uh, and I found this with a lot of um, people, not just for Gobekli Tepe or Luwian or things like that, but they look at like a script from over here and they look like from a script from over here and they look for similarities and they're like, oh, this letter looks kind of like this letter over here, you know, and they find two or three of them and they're like, they must be related, you know, like um, the handbags. <laughs> yeah, but that's not enough, you know, To you have to actually to show a relation. First of all, there's other there's other evidences of relation besides just similarity of symbols. I, I for example, I, I had to talk to someone the other day about they think that um, uh, what, what were they comparing? They were comparing the Indus Valley civilization script with uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs or something. No, no, it was something else. I can't remember now. But again, it was just like, oh, look at this is similar to that. And this kind of looks like this. And this kind of looks like that, you know. And you, it could be like completely different sounds. It could be like, it could, you know what I'm saying? Like sometimes these scripts we can actually read and we know they're just different. They're just different, you know. Uh, but they happen to have uh, symbols that look the same. Um, it's a coincidence. Uh, you need more than that. With with historical linguistics, you can trace languages, where they come from, and what's related to what other language, you know. Um, now, it is true that the Indus Valley Civilization script, we don't know what language they spoke, so kind of up in the air. But um, it's more than just looking for similarities that's going to that's gonna do it for you, you know. Um, oh, I know what it was. It was Brahmi, the Brahmi script. Um, they said, oh, it's Brahmi because um, of some similarities. But no, this is a good example because scholars think that Brahmi is related to Semitic script. Now, why do they think it's related to Semitic script, like Phoenician, uh, but not the Indus Valley script? Because there are not only more similarities, like there's like a lot of that carried over, right? It's very, very close in a lot of ways, but also because we know there was contact from what from one people to another people that we know how it got there, right? So there's it's just stronger, stronger evidence for a connection. Whereas just finding a couple of interesting, you know, similarities isn't really enough. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, you know, along those lines of just looking at evidence from a very specific aspect and kind of forgetting all the rest. It, <clears throat> it reminds me of how, you know, Graham Hancock used to use Gobekli Tepe as this one enigmatic site that proves there was a lost civilization because you're just looking at one site. But that site is only, you know, has what 5% of it that's been excavated. And now over the last decades, there's been many other sites that are even older than Gobekli Tepe that now create a bigger picture rather than this one enigmatic site that must prove yeah. some ancient lost And he civilization. still left all that out. Yeah, did yeah he, totally. I'm trying to remember, in ancient apocalypse, did he talk about any of the other sites around Gobekli Tepe? Yeah, I the one remember. with the with the scary looking face. I forget the name of the okay. site. Okay. Oh yeah, was it Karahan Tepe or something? Karahan Tepe. Yeah. Uh, but there was there's like a there's like a dozen of them uh, over there. Um, yeah, and and it shows a clear progression of hunter gatherers slowly becoming you know more sedentary and building settlements, which shows the settlements became uh, came before agriculture. And he just completely leaves all this whole story out. I've actually really enjoyed Matt from Ancient Architects. His series, he's put out, yeah, I don't know, he's... 15 or 20 videos on these sites, and he's done a fantastic job. I, it's hard to follow everything in the archeo oh, archaeological yeah, yeah. world, so I just tend to like look to certain people for information, and he's been my kind of go-to guy on that, you yeah. know, go Beckley yeah. Tepe realm of things. It's fascinating to see. Like, I love that as time goes on, we find more evidence that gives us a much, much more clear picture of history, and now there's really absolutely no reason to think Gobekli Tepe had anything to do with the lost civilization. Um, now, an interesting thing I'm, I'm still curious about is Martin Sweatman's work. And I know you guys had a, a funny little back and forth. Has anything progressed with that? In, no, he, he's kind of gone way? off the grid. Um, he's, I don't think, at least last I checked, he hasn't been on social media or YouTube. 
Um, yeah, I so noticed. Gonna... I noticed his his last video is a response to you, and then he just. I think that just kind of. Yeah, after I responded to him, he he went off the grid. Um, but he's going to be at the big conference in the summer. Um, from what I understand. You said you were thinking he was about crashing Apocalypse. it. <laughs> like, what do you mean crashing the conference? Like, what? It just jump when up I, and when grab I said the I mic. Was gonna... Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I was going to go with a video camera and just try to say, I got to speak to Graham or something, you know, <laughs> just to see what would happen. You should do but it. I, it's, a, it's a stunt. But I mean, I want to debate <laughs> Graham. He told me I could debate him. I was going to say something like that. <laughs> you might just ruffle a bunch of feathers trying that. Yeah, they might not like me. I mean, the but, other thing I could do is I could just, well, I don't want to pay for it. It's expensive. It's like $600 wow. or something. Yeah, um, that's a lot of money. Yeah, it's I am more than still like, interested it's though. More than Comic Con, you know. Um, hmm. Yeah, but um, but I wouldn't mind like going to one of these conferences and just uh, walking around and interviewing people and getting to know them a little bit better and talk to them about things and ask them questions and you know it might be neat to do that. Yeah, totally. I'm sure you could make some cool videos on your channel. You know, having yeah kind of yeah. friendly little short debates with people about stuff. Yeah. I know um uh there was a um a scientist, a woman scientist who uh wrote a book recently about uh, uh flat earthers. Can't remember the name of the book. Can't remember her name. <laughs> but she she went to uh flat earther conventions to kind of meet everybody and get to know them. And so it this is in her book, you know, about what they're like and the personality and it's a lot there's a lot of similarities actually when you think about it um but totally. um, i found it interesting but she was willing to go there and to meet the people and to learn about them and hear in their own voices and you know uh yeah they made a documentary about that um what's it called behind the curve have you guys seen that i watched it it's uh quite fascinating they go to these conventions they film people they show them they're not trying to ridicule the flat earth community they're trying to show them in their real colors and like make them out to be very friendly people they're genuine they're kind you know it's a very respectful yeah. film in the end they they debunk themselves and the the documentary shows them actually prove themselves wrong which is quite funny but uh i think it actually one thing i learned about that film was the <clears throat> the benefit of showing people that you disagree with in a very compassionate light rather than ridiculing and you know throwing ad hominem attacks at each other's characters and this kind of thing let's really like treat each other with kindness and respect and listen to each other and hear what the others have to say. And we can disagree, but in a professional and friendly and courteous manner. And that's something I really appreciated um, about that film. But yeah, you're right. There are some similarities with the, the flat earth community and the lost civilization camp. <laughs> um, it's funny too. Like if, if, uh, if you run into a, um, like a lost ancient high technology person, but they're not an ancient aliens person. <clears throat> they will get offended if you link them with ancient aliens. You know, oh, we're not, we're not like them. They're they're completely off their rockers. You know, we're talking about Atlantis. It's completely different. You know, um, but I've had people because um, some in some of my videos I'll say, and these are things that maybe the ancient aliens or the Atlantis people might say, and and some of the Atlantis people are like, how dare you lump us in with the ancient aliens people? <laughs> Well, you're both saying this, so that's why I said that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, they have a lot of overlap, for sure. So one one thing uh, I had a question about is when we were in um, in at Mount Sinai, uh, we had posted a photo uh, on Facebook of us standing on top of Mount Sinai, and someone's response to me was, that it wasn't the correct Mount Sinai. Uh, we went, we went to where you know Saint Catherine's is, and they said that actually Mount Sinai is in uh, Saudi Arabia, and it got me thinking. Like, is is there an academic like consensus about where the site of Mount Sinai is, and uh, is is it where we think it is now? <laughs> there, there is an academic consensus. And the consensus is we don't know where it is. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that that Mount Sinai, I mean, it could be the Mount Sinai, but um, it was 
I think it was chosen at some point, and you know, and they're like, okay, this is going to be Mount Sinai, <laughs> you know, and then they build the monastery there. Somebody thought it was Mount Sinai, and but we really don't know where it is. That's hilarious. We were up on top of Mount Sinai just being like, wow, this is like so sacred, this place. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, it's one of the most beautiful it's places. It's a possibility, but yeah. Um, you know, yeah, it was a, it was, um, it's hard to say where it is. There, you'd think, because like in the Bible, there's a lot of geography, you'd think you'd be able to figure it out. But there's still a lot of leeway. You're like, well, it could be over here. It could be over. There's a lot of mountains, you know, so you, it's hard to say. Okay. So what are what are some of the most, like your favorite archaeological sites that you've been to? Um, a few pop up into my mind. I mean, obviously Egypt is incredible. Baalbek, you know, Angkor, places in, in Mexico like Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan. I'm curious, like, awesome. what are some of your favorites or what would you say is kind of the... Um, the most fun to visit or maybe the most beautiful or the most impressive? Well, of the ones that I've visited, and I haven't visited as many as you might think, uh, of the ones I've visited, I'll tell you that first, and then I'll tell you the ones I want to visit. Um, so the ones I've visited, I really love um, Saqqara. In fact, I liked it even better than Giza. Um, I really loved Rome. Rome is a great place. Um, I loved um, Ephesus is a really cool site. Um, I loved um, Chichen Itza, great mm -hmm. site. Um, it, w it was a really fun site. I sometimes they're fun not as much because of what's there, but of the way of getting there. It's like it like in uh, going into the jungles way deep in there to go to a site makes it fun even if you get so like caracol was like a really cool site because you had to travel really far into the deep jungle to go there and it Where was a cool that? site I mean, not the most spectacular site ever but like th it was an adventure to go there made it fun you know yeah i had a fun one like that um yachitlan bonampak like in okay Chiapas. yeah yeah it's an hour's away have you been there you have to go up a boat no like, no uh, I, it's on the bucket list yeah yeah, it's great. Um, I was like hitchhiking around and camping with my dog, uh, I don't know, 13 years ago. And I met this Italian film crew um, at some hostel and they invited me to come with them. Um, and it's a very expensive trip. You got to hire a boat. It's like hours up the river. It's a whole day trip. You know, you got to get a tour guide and all that kind of stuff. And they paid for me to go and just invited me to come wow. along. So I got really? to go out there and they had the Mayan elder um, indigenous people with these beautiful white robes. And they were filming uh -huh. a documentary, um, burning like Copal and like doing these ritual offerings and smoke in the air with the pyramids and the temples behind them. It was fantastic. That was, yeah. Talk about having the adventure to get to a site. That one really um, stuck in my memory a lot. That was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as ones I haven't gone to yet. I mean, I, I have all these places on the list, but I want to go to um, Baalbek. I haven't gone there yet. Oh man, uh, Baalbek is something else. It's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, you so you've been there? Yeah. Yeah, we mm -hmm. in 2019 we spent like a month and a half or so in Egypt and went almost everywhere. We did, and we then did, we went to Jordan. We took the boat across to Jordan. We did 70 different archaeological sites oh, from wow. Egypt. Go to Petra. Yeah, mm -hmm. Petra is beautiful, huh? There's not ton to see right but there's there's some amazing things oh there. there's a ton to see oh like, is there a ton we spent ton. three like, days we spent three, three days, days they always show the same yeah temple, no, we we know? gotta we gotta put our, our video on it because we had no idea the scope of this place you could, we went up on a on a like overlook overlooking like the whole uh site and you can see for miles and just see like little caves and dwellings carved into the oh. mountains as far as the eye can see it's like incredible like that's one of the biggest actually that i think we've been to oh okay all right and people never mention yeah, I think that it's I like I 12 think... kilometers from wow. front to back they always you can show hike, the like, same we, pictures 12 miles. Uh, yeah. yeah yeah so Maybe. you know uh some places i wanted to mention uh like one of my favorite uh places in terms of landscape and the feeling I had when I was there is uh, Cappadocia and uh, Darren Kuyu and the mm. underground tunnels and just well I'm gonna go the Darren Kuyu and uh, probably 
in a month or a uh, couple of months. Wow, cool. I'm going to do it. We're, I'm doing a Western Are you going to go trip. Yeah. on a, are you doing like a private tour um, no, no. after uh, hours? I'm going to do another antiquities travel guide in uh, okay, Western Because in the daytime, there's hundreds and hundreds of people in Daring Kuyu all the time, toured groups coming in. I barely could catch a 10 second video with no people in the shop. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, if you need any, it's very crowded in there. Yeah. If you need any uh, tips or whatever, you can. Uh, we're happy to help uh, guide you if you need any assistance in that. Um, yeah, that that area is absolutely mind blowing and incredible. And it also, I, it, it, are you going to Gobekli Tepe? I assume if you're going to Darren. No, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do Eastern Turkey on a separate trip. There's so okay. much to see just on the western side. Yeah, uh -huh. that I'm uh, sticking with that for. Yeah. We haven't really seen the western side, uh, like the coastal area, because we spent all of our time in eastern Turkey going uh, to places. But the amount of history in, in Turkey is just like unparalleled. Uh, oh, yeah. and like San Lirfa, uh, the near Gobekli Tepe, has not only one of the nicest museums I've it, it's my favorite museum I've ever been to, better than the Met and a lot uh, of and a lot really, of it's absolutely incredible and I, we want to do a wow. video just on that because uh the amount of history in that in that museum and local history mind you you know the met has like artifacts from all around the world that are just precious and amazing i get a little bit bitter about how that feels like thievery to me but uh in san lirfa the museum is all local artifacts that date back you know twelve thousand years and has some it, some of the most amazing artifacts I've seen anywhere. And it's really well presented and a very nice museum. Wow. Good to know. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. As you walk through the museum, you start at, you know, 13,000 or 12,000 years and there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of artifacts. And then you walk through from, you know, section after section after section just progresses closer and closer in the timeline towards us in history. <clears throat> and leads you through the the Neolithic, the the pot, you know, the pottery period, the uh, the different metal ages, eventually into the the Greek and Roman times, all the way up until until modern times. So it, we spent I don't know three or four hours in there, probably more, and it was just like the coolest, concise display of history from very far back in time all the way up until now all in one place i absolutely love that music i mean you, you get to the sumerians and you're like oh we're already like in modern history <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah <laughs> wow that's cool very cool well, it, i'll look that, forward to go that that was another question i had for you are you much of a museum buff do you have I love your, museums <laughs> love museums wh where's where's your favorite museum you've been to oh well kind of hard to beat the british museum it's a great mm -hmm. museum uh lots of ancient material there um and i do love the met i also loved um the cairo museum uh the egyptian the museum cairo, cairo museum is just like mm -hmm. a, a bit anxiety inducing they, the way they lay that place out it's just like I how know. do i even begin in here <laughs> yeah you're like yeah there's like I, I know I didn't even see everything there because you know there there's rooms off of here and off of there and you don't know even what order to to look at them and yeah we we couldn't find the schist disc uh we spent our whole time like that was one of the things I really wanted to see and we could we didn't couldn't find, find it. it I'm sure it was I like somewhere it. pretty I, I like... saw it either that place gave me a headache man I remember <laughs> leaving there feeling like bewildered like I don't where was I I couldn't find everything I was looking for spinning in circles back yeah. in this room end up in a new room find a new section of the museum you didn't even know was there but now, you gotta um, admit there's heard... a lot there yeah absolutely well, and is the, the is the new museum open by the way the one out at yeah, Giza um I heard that the only the front room or something is open uh and it won't the mm. whole museum won't be open until the end of the year so we keep delaying I it. I thought when I went in December that it would be open, but nope. You know. Hmm. Speaking hmm. of uh, the schist, um, schist disc, what do you what do you think of that? Well, um, I've been planning for a long time to make a video on it for my artifacts series, but I haven't been able to find uh, someone to interview about it. That's what's <laughs> delaying me. And now I'm thinking, well, maybe I should just do it myself. But I, that's the, kind of the artifact series I'm supposed to interview a curator or somebody like that who knows about the uh the object and um i haven't been able to find somebody for the schist disc mm. but um because I, I i found an article on it recently not sure yet if i'm convinced by it but that it was used for beer brewing huh. like an amarna huh 
like at Amarna? Uh, Amarna, I don't know if it was. Well, I don't know. I've uh, I've heard it, this. I've, I guess the reason why I bring that up is I've heard uh, multiple uh, sources saying uh, that beer actually originates in Amarna. Uh, oh, with uh, with uh, uh, Akhenaten. So. Oh, I oh oh I think it goes well well before that well okay. before that prehistoric. Probably. Oh, wow. There's actually a beer, um, the brewery called Dogfish Head. I don't know if you guys are beer guys, but they have a beer called Midas Touch, and it's based on that beer. They studied ancient um, oh, vessels yeah. from Amarna, and they could do like a chemical analysis on what ingredients were put in there. And they tried mm -hmm. their best to recreate what they could consider a modern version of that ancient beer, but they kind of supercharged it. It's like a honey mead or honey wine kind of beer, and it's extremely delicious. <laughs> I oh, recommend wow. that one. <laughs> Um, I uh, I know that in this particular theory, they uh, they bring in those those vats that are uh, at um, El uh, at Abu Ghraib. I don't know if you know about those those big yeah. bowls. Yeah, we saw them firsthand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they think that the the disc was used to. Uh, um, I, I I don't know a lot about the process of making beer, but it, it's to. Uh, <laughs> it, was for, it was to mix something. Um, that was the theory. I'm not sure. Uh, but what I do know is that that could not have been a machine. Uh, uh, well, they're, that's fair. They're, they're saying using it as a machine, but it couldn't have been used on anything hard. Like it couldn't, it's not, people think of it as some kind of a gear or something like that, but it would never have held up. It would have broken immediately. It seems very you know, fragile. For anything, yeah, like a machine. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I tend to think it's probably just a kind of a vase, you know. But um, mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not, I don't feel strongly any particular way. Well, mm. so in this in this kind of uh, theme, uh, would you be open to me just kind of popcorning some things out, and we just do like quick little uh, uh, debunk uh, media, if you will, like a yeah, sure. Uh, so war shock test. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, one of them would be, uh, the stegosaurus, uh, that you see in, uh, I don't know if you've seen this in, I have uh, Angkor. Oh, Angkor. Yeah. In the Angkor complex. Do you uh, have any idea what that could be? Uh, from what I remember, I think it's, um, it's just, it's an animal with some bushes in the background and they're just behind it. And then people have mistaken it for like the, the things on the stegosaurus's back. I mean, when we <laughs> saw it firsthand, when we were there, it looks very much like a stegosaurus uh, in, in the time sent, uh, like reviewing it. It almost looks like a chameleon to me with like maybe plants in the background. So uh -huh. I, I could definitely see that. Okay, uh, so the next one uh, would be the Abydos helicopter. Have you, have you seen that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, this is um, two uh, two sets of hieroglyphs superimposed on one another. So it's part of one hieroglyph and part of another hieroglyph, and they got mel melded together uh, as the two uh, converged. So we're not actually seeing uh, a single drawing, but two on top of each other. It reminds me of like a pair of Paradosis? Uh, there's a word for this where where you pareidolia? see pareidolia, yeah, where you see something and kind of just like ascribe it to something that you already yeah, know. Yeah, it's like about. when you see a cloud and you're like, yeah. oh, that looks like a ship or whatever. Yeah, yeah. All right, I got a popcorn question for you. What's happening with your website? I tried to go on there. It doesn't seem to load. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's down right now. Um, I noticed. I I've been having trouble with it. My um, both my hosting service and my domain service are saying it's the other one's fault um <laughs> oh dang so I, I i'm I, i'm trying to figure it out but anyway i got a guy who's looking at it right now and hopefully i get it back up soon so it sounds like we just debunked the fact that you have a website that's, that's <laughs> good um all right uh the next one is uh the osirion flower of life have you seen this mm, i'm not sure what you're referring to Oh, okay. it's like so, uh, 10 feet up off the ground on one of those giant, you know, rectangular like, granite columns. You got to look up. It's like um, it looks like red ochre paint. Some people say it's laser 
burn yeah so this is zone. this is how we found out about it is like uh it may have been graham hancock uh uh some someone that we were reading about uh many years ago talks about it as if it's like laser etched into the stone being there ourselves it looks like red o ochre paint to us but uh and also, you know, the flower of life has become very, uh, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with yeah. the symbol, but it's like become very famous in the new age crowd. And so it, it, it gained traction because, you know, the Egyptians were drawing, uh, the flower of life, but it turns out like in our research, it seems as though it was done by the Romans possibly later. Oh, oh yeah. It could be like a, a, a Greco Roman, uh, uh, object. Yeah. I, um, this reminds me, there was a fellow on Twitter who wrote a whole article about how this vase that Uncharted X has, had measured, or mm -hmm. Chris Dunn's son had measured, um, proved, you know, that this was uh, too advanced for the ancient Egyptians. Uh, but in his blog article, he superimposes the flower of life on top of the vase. <laughs> and he's like of measuring course. it with the flower of life. <laughs> and I, and I, I made a comment about something about it being new agey and uh he was greatly offended uh <laughs> that i even suggested such a thing but um i have seen it the flower of life pop up from time to time <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i'd actually love to talk with you about that vase too um uh, alan from sacred geometry decoded turned us on to a guy on twitter he's uh from slovakia he's like a photogrammetry expert and he um has done like, I guess you can take hundreds and hundreds of photos with like a nice Sony camera or whatever, walking around an object and like ca capturing it from many angles and then piece together a 3D model. So he's done a lot of that kind of work mm -hmm. and he has experience in analyzing, um, I guess, 3D models. But then he he downloaded the um, software. I don't know what software they use to like analyze the, um, the exact geometries and um, precision specifications of the of the vase um, that that un Ben from Uncharted X has been showing, but uh, I think Ben made that information public so people can download it and look at it. You know the yeah. scans from Christopher Dunn's son, and so this guy looked at it and he found a lot of irregularities and asymmetrical aspects of it and kind of errors you could say, um, and it's quite a lot to to look through. I only looked at it briefly, but I wrote to the guy recently and invited him to come talk with us. He says his English isn't oh. so good. So we're going to keep it more of a written format of communicating. But I think soon we're going to make a video on that and make sure we get his accurate depiction of that, of that vase. But he's basically showing, and again, you have to look through many, many photos and look at like very technical, you know, very technical analysis that he did on the vase. But it seems to me it's not as precise um, as it's, you know, I, maybe some aspects of it are extremely precise and other aspects are not. So uh, that's yeah. something I, I, I wonder if I, I saw that Twitter thread as well. Uh, his um, name is Marian Marcis. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what his Twitter channel is, but that's his uh, name. I'll double check. Yeah, I, I'm, I'll, I'm also planning a stone vase uh, video, but it's more about the history of Egyptian stone vases. And I will mention... Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. That that measured vase, but maybe I can use some bullet points from your guys' video, <laughs> and I'll point <laughs> people to it for more info or something. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to that video baseball. from you. It, it's yeah, very the... weird how they people focus on certain things. Like, who would have thought that people would be like uh, stone vases? This is the smoking gun here. <laughs> stone vases. You know, of all things to pick. Well, it's um, the engineers who came along and started finding all these detailed stoneworks and looked at it from a different angle from archaeologists and Egyptologists and an engineer, you know, with their credible background can look at something and cre create quite a stir. Turns out a lot of that's actually not accurate. I mean, look at Christopher Dunn, for example, with the Serapian boxes. Turns out they're not as precise and he only measured yeah. one of them. And that whole argument and, is just ridiculous. And the <laughs> Ramsey statue that he apparently <clears throat> measured to precision on his computer at home using photographs <laughs> um yeah it's in, but it is interesting what i was this is one of the things that surprised me was when i saw that people were pointing to egyptian statues actual <laughs> statues of egyptians they're in the egyptian <laughs> clothes you know they're wearing they, they look exactly like egyptians and they were saying those are not egyptians <laughs> I just found that very strange. 
Um, well, I think they they think that the Egyptians modeled their culture after yeah. the lost culture, the lost yeah yeah I I found that out, but it is it is interesting that uh, <laughs> um, why would the advanced culture of of this great civilization uh, wear clothes like that? Um, wouldn't they have more high tech clothes? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I picture them. More like in the Starfleet uniforms or something, but <laughs> oh, this is this is a something I wanted to mention as well. Another thing that comes up in these conversations is the Tartarians. Have you heard of the Tartarians? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And the mud. Of course, this isn't really ancient history. This is like what eighteen hundreds or something. They thought that this this cataclysm mud flood happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it is very similar to the kind of things we've been talking about. It's almost uh, like instead of a pre uh, like a prehistoric civilization, now it's like a a modern yeah, it's civilization. More recent, <laughs> and then there was a cataclysm. Yes, yeah. Uh, that and they're covering it up. Every they're they're covering up. <laughs> Speaking of this cataclysms, is a very strange idea. What are what are your thoughts on the the younger Gaius comet impact theory? Um, I have no strong feelings one way or the other. If whether there was a comet impact, maybe there was a comet impact. I don't know. I haven't been convinced of it yet, but, um, but what that doesn't have anything to do with with demonstrating that there's a lost advanced civilization. Yeah, right. Um, you know, I I could say that the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs destroyed a lost advanced civilization. You know, I I have no proof of that. Uh, if you're going to show that there's a lost advanced civilization, showing that it how it was destroyed doesn't tell you that it was there you know um, totally it's definitely interesting just... though i mean we we went on a tour with um randall carlson I'd, i i'm no geologist and again like i you know i'm just a, a simple traveling musician researcher guy who's trying to study things about ancient history but to me it seems like it's highly um plausible that the comet impact is going to turn out to be proven correct i was listening to a conversation with um Christopher Moore and uh, Nathan something or other, some archaeologist. Um, and and Christopher Moore is, all, is a geoarchaeologist. He's been working on uh, many Clovis sites around North America. And he they they were both saying it seems like the most highly compelling theory. And these are mainstream archaeologists. So I thought that was quite cool. Um, but again, you don't need to have, you know, it doesn't prove any lost civilization. Those, those two things are, are separate uh, topics entirely. But I do think that Randall Carlson's work is quite compelling in that aspect about that a comet would have struck the North American ice cap. That's why we don't see a crater. It would have struck in the oceans. Um, and man, have you been to the Scablands, by the way? You should definitely go uh, if you haven't. It is but unbelievable. My, my, my friend, uh, uh, Bob Schneider, the geologist, he he says that Carlson is completely wrong about the Scablands. <laughs> so, oh, yeah? But I don't know anything about the subject. He, he actually um, asked... Carlson to debate him on the subject and and Randall said yes at first but then he's been ghosting him so I guess it's not going to happen but do, do you know what he says that Carlson is wrong about on this uh, no I I don't know for sure I, I mean I can ask him next time I see him but um I don't I don't know a lot about that area I, he, he did tell me briefly kind of a summary but i don't even remember the details it'd be awesome if we had him on because we've done a whole video on randall oh, Carlton. yeah randall He'd be happy to come work. on yeah and He'd be happy to come on i can give you his contact info yeah we, be great. we went we went deep and like like we do with a lot of the subjects that we we look at we we went pretty deep on it and did one of the more comprehensive videos about randall carlson's work that's that you can find and so like we feel like we we know it pretty well and it seems convincing to us but i would love to like debunk our video <laughs> with them yeah oh, yeah i mean yeah, it's yeah. still it's still a controversial topic but whether or not it was from a comet or not either way there were massive massive floods at least one if not many 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 floods that went through that region and to go there in person and see that landscape is just unbelievable to see what water can do to earth carving out massive massive cataracts in in widening and, and deepening the the columbia river basin i mean we drove i think 400 miles or so from the top end of this the flood down to um to you know past portland oregon where it drained into the pacific ocean 
And even like hundreds and hundreds of miles away, we went up to a site called Crown Point. It's 720 feet above the modern Columbia River. And we still would have been underwater from that flood. I mean, it's it's like they for sure know that the floodwaters reached that that height. At some places, it was 1,200 feet deep, like passing through Wallula Gap. It's un, it's unimaginable. Like you you stand there and look around and try to imagine, you know, 200 feet of water, 400 feet of water above your head, 500, 800, a thousand feet of water above your head. It's just it's just insane. Uh, I well, find that I, one of the most interesting places I've ever been. Don't don't be don't be uh, certain yet about it until you talk to Bob. Um, you know who else would, might be able to tell you something about it is uh, Potholer Fifty Four. He's a geologist, um, but I don't know. I don't know how to contact him. But um, yeah, Bob would love to talk to you about it. Yeah, yeah. Please put us in contact with him. I bet we could find Potholer Fifty Four too. We have a knack for like finding people. You know, we talked to Aiden Dodson on the Serapium series yeah. we made. We're we're oh, yeah, looking, yeah, yeah. We're looking through these papers of like Aiden Dodson and we found uh, another one, uh, Jim Harrell, a uh, geologist. Oh, and, Jim Harrell. Yeah. 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 And, and we're just like, uh, look at looking them up on their <laughs> university things. And we just called them up and they answered like, uh, yeah, I, pretty easily. I thought it was, it was like, a joke. easy to contact him. Like, I didn't <laughs> yeah. think he would actually answer. I thought, yeah, we'll call him. And then he answered and he's like, this is James. We're like, Oh, uh, <laughs> Start filming, record this, talk to him. Uh, where are our questions? <laughs> yeah, it was great. Well, it was great talking to you guys. I got to get going. Yeah, thank but, you so uh, much for joining us. It was wonderful. I enjoyed it very much. Um, and uh, I wish you guys the best for your channel. Um, anything I can do to help you guys out, let me know. Yeah, yeah likewise. Well, maybe, maybe you could uh, come on someday and, and have a, a friendly debate. I have this vision of us kind of being mediate friendly, neutral mediators who can like oh, debate, debate with you guys. You know? No, oh, with, yeah. some, with another guest, oh, like, an, Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 If, if yeah. like we said before, we don't know how many of them might be willing to come on, you know, from the lost civilization group, um, come on our channel, but, um, yeah. Also, if you ever need any video from a site or if you ever just want to chat, let us know. It's great talking with you. Thank you so much for coming Thank on you. to speak with us today. I really appreciate your time. I, I very much be happy to do so. It was a pleasure. Awesome. Nice. And for all of our subscribers, make sure to go to David's YouTube channel, World of Antiquity, and check out all his videos, especially his recent Saqqara video. That was fantastic. And uh, yeah, subscribe to his channel. Send him some love. Yeah. Thanks again, David. We really appreciated this podcast. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you guys.